People facing a long wait for a diagnosis of suspected autism are apparently suffering increased anxiety and poor mental health, often without any support. New research has found 60% of people on the waiting list still haven't been assessed after a year, despite a 13-week target. Sky's Emma Birchley has this special report. Growing up, Amy always felt different, not understanding the way her friends thought, struggling to keep eye contact and seen as weird for obsessing about certain topics. But 18 months after asking her GP for an assessment for autism, she's still waiting. Instead, she decided to read about it herself. I actually cried at some passages and I underlined a lot and everything because I had never experienced anyone articulating these feelings and thoughts that I had that I couldn't even articulate myself. At times, it's affected Amy's mental health and she's not alone. In a survey, 93% of autistic people said the state of their mental health was having an impact on their life, with 70% receiving no professional support and only 6% describing the help they'd been given as having met their needs. The research also revealed that three in five people had had to wait more than a year to be assessed on the NHS, during which time, in many cases, their mental health had taken a turn for the worse. That's despite the target being a wait of no more than 13 weeks. The study was carried out by an organisation called Brain in Hand, which provides digital and one-to-one -one help for those with autism, most of whom get it publicly funded. It estimates there could be as many as 1.5 million people with autism in the UK. The number of people who are autistic in this country and the outcomes that they will experience, things like a higher chance of suicide, um, less likely to be in work, it feels like it's a sort of public health crisis that hasn't been acknowledged. A spokesperson for the Department of Health and Social Care said they know how vital a timely diagnosis of autism is and have made £4.2 million available this year to improve services for autistic children and young people. But Amy has waited so long she's found a therapist herself. I know a lot of people are not in the position that I am and are not able to pay for a therapist themselves and I, I can't imagine how, how difficult it must be for them. Now it's her second Christmas waiting to be diagnosed, with no indication of when that might happen. Emma Birchley, Sky News. Well, let's talk now to Connor Ward, an autistic consultant at Brain and Hand, which helps those with autism better manage their lives. Um, good to talk to you today, Connor. Just, just explain why, when someone suspects that they may have autism, they need a diagnosis. What, what does that bring? Thank you very much for having me. So a lot of people approach having a clinical diagnosis when they think they're autistic uh, because a lot of support mechanisms require that diagnosis still. Um, a, a, a clinical diagnosis says so-and-so has, has these needs and therefore this support will be adequate. Um, that's not necessarily working for everybody. Not everybody is getting the support they need from that anymore. So what, what are these kind of, of, of steps that, that people uh, can, can be recommended to have, perhaps for their employers, perhaps at school? What are the kind of, of practical things that can help those with autism? So in supporting autistic people, we tend to look at more practical solutions. So a lot of the things that impact autistic people's ability to thrive in any kind of environment are normally environmental factors. So are environments built in a way that are going to cope on a sensory level? Is there anything too overwhelming in that? Are we being clear with our communication? Um, looking at those kind of factors is a great start to being really helpful to ensure that you've just got a, a, an environment that's going to allow anybody to, th to thrive, whether they're autistic or not. But I suppose I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of these things, if you, if you suspect you're autistic and you are bothered by, you know, for example, sensory overloads, these are steps you could perhaps take yourself ahead of a diagnosis. You know, you, you could take steps, practical steps yourself, couldn't you, to, to make a lot of these changes? Yeah, certainly. There's a lot of things that we can just do generally as humans to increase, you know, our well-being and, and make sure that we are looking after ourselves. But ultimately, the kind of the larger structure, the, you know, the larger support that's needed in a workplace, for instance, to ensure that your needs are actually going to be met. That's where we are seeing a diagnosis still needing to, to be put in place and not everybody is being able to access that. So why do you think the wait is, is now so long for people? Uh, 
ultimately, I think that it's in the wrong place. You know, we, we, it, it lives in the clinical world currently. Um, I, I, it doesn't necessarily have to live there. A lot of autistic people, um, I think, you know, are, are after the same things as everyone else. We just want to be able to have a good education, have a good uh, work life, have uh, a good, you know, a good family life. But um, yeah, the wait list is built up because we have a better understanding now as to what it means to be autistic. And the current system isn't built for that. The NHS is brilliant, but quite simply, this is no longer a process that works for how we now think about autistic people. So, is it so you think it, it, that people shouldn't be directed down the NHS route? Where should they go for, for help and advice? Well, for some people, a, a, a diagnosis will still be necessary for the amount of support, but ultimately, I think now we are looking to more digital solutions. So, you know, things like Brain in Hand can help somebody get a better understanding of themselves. Um, going to places like the National Autistic Society to learn a bit more about what kind of support is out there. Um, there's a whole range of support, but ultimately we know we are still nowhere near meeting the amount of support that, that the autistic population needs in this country. Is part of the issue also the large number of people who are now coming forward and thinking that they may have autism? Well, it, it's an issue in the sense of the current system isn't built for that. But ultimately, the more people that we realise are autistic, the more we can build our society around working with people with a whole host of different brains. Um, because, you know, we, we should celebrate the diversity of how, of how people think and how people approach situations. Um, so I think these numbers are showing that we need to have massive change happen. We just aren't. We are, we're using old systems to cope with modern ideologies. Uh, so what are the, the new systems that help those who are, who are neuro, neurodiverse perhaps function better in the workplace or function in a way that those who aren't neurodiverse find it easier to cope with? Well, you know, we are seeing a lot more of a person-led approach. So looking at what a person themselves actually needs. So when we explore what barriers somebody's facing, um, we can delve into a bit more as to what specific strategies are going to work for them. Um, so that kind of person-centric approach is always going to be what's beneficial. And, uh, you know, as, as mentioned, bread in hand, one way of doing that. But ultimately, um, we need more information out there. We, we need more education so that, that people can get that. Because at the moment, social media is kind of your best bet. And in terms of, of, of information getting out there, do you think that there is a greater understanding now than perhaps there was five or, or ten years ago about autism and about what those with autism can bring to all, all manner of environments by coming up with different solutions, just thinking differently, processing stuff differently? Yeah, certainly. Like, it, it, information has come on a long way. Like, the first person to ever be diagnosed autistic only died previously, the, you know, earlier this year. So it's still relatively new in the grand scheme of human history. But, you know, the last five years specifically, we've really come on in not thinking of being autistic as a deficit, being less than than, than other people. We, we recognise that we're all different people in this world. We all have different strengths to contribute. Um, and yeah, we should only celebrate that. I mean, do you think we're also going to get to a point where organisations, I know, you know, for example, organisations like GCHQ are, are particularly looking for people who have neurodiversity because of the way that their brain works. Do you think we're going to get to the position where actually having autism is, is, is something that almost some employers are going to want in employees? Yeah, certainly, because, um, you know, the more we look at humans as people with different strengths and skills like I you know I'm autistic the way I explain that to people is that I have a detail-oriented brain that is a skill that many industries can benefit from and we are seeing growing numbers in in industries like engineering computing um it, it, it's about just getting people into the jobs that are going to get the most skill out of them um and that is how we start to build a world that allows people to, to thrive but there's still far too many barriers from getting that to be uh, happening anytime soon Okay, Connor Ward uh, from the organisation Brain in Hand. Good to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.